Well, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me turn to introducing our keynote speaker. And given that we are in Scotland, I am deeply honoured to be joined uh, by our keynote speaker, the First Minister of Scotland. And I understand that the First Minister is an avid reader and she gives us all annual recommendations of what books to read. And so I'll commit here and now in my New Year's resolution to reading more First Minister in 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute great pleasure to introduce the First Minister of Scotland, the leader of the Scottish National Party, the Right Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP, for her keynote address. First Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for, for that kind introduction. I probably would be well advised and it would be your, in your interest if I didn't go off on a book tangent because I might be here for some time without talking about what you're actually here to, to discuss. But um, yeah, look out for my annual recommendations in a couple of weeks sometime before Christmas. Uh, look, thank you to all of you for, for being here in Edinburgh. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here and spend some time with you. This conference and I think what this conference represents is really important to me and to the Scottish Government. Over the last few years, Scottish financial enterprise, just like the Scottish Government, has worked really hard to strengthen its partnership with the City of London. So this event, I think, is a really concrete output from all of that work and symbolises the partnership that is going from strength to strength, in my view, and I'm really grateful to both organisations for organising it. Now, much of what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, will follow on from the theme of the last panel session that I know you've just been having and that I came in just at the tail end of. I, I want to focus particularly on the role of financial services in helping Scotland and indeed the rest of the world to get to net zero. Uh, but it might be worth beginning with some reflections on the 12 months or now slightly more than that since COP26 took place in, in Scotland's other great city, uh, Glasgow. Obviously the year since then couldn't have been predicted when the world gathered in Glasgow. Uh, we've seen Putin's invasion of Ukraine prompting an energy crisis exacerbating a wider cost crisis and all of that is having the most profound impact on individuals and businesses right across the country, Europe and indeed much of the world. And of course financial services has been no exception to that. In a year when I know all of us were really hoping that the easing of the pandemic would lead to an economic recovery, I know all too well that this has been an incredibly difficult 12 months for many businesses generally, but that includes many businesses in the financial sector. But I think your response to all of that adversity it has been hugely impressive. Uh, for example, uh, together with John McGuigan, I co-chair the Financial Services Growth and Development Board here in Scotland. That's the body that helps the public sector work more closely with the financial services sector. And in discussions about the cost crisis, I've been very struck by just how committed banks and other lenders have been to helping businesses and households who are experiencing often quite acute difficulties. You have offered people and businesses guidance and information on how to navigate and get through this crisis. I know uh, many in the sector have worked with government and also with charities, for example, using data and fintech to identify and then support some of the people who are right now most in need of help. And again, many across the sector have also provided tailored support for some of the economic sectors that are most affected by the crisis. Uh, to give just one example, I you know, had a meeting with one bank recently which had developed a special package for agriculture customers, including measures like uh, capital repayment holidays. And that's obviously important given the, the nature of the Scottish economy and the importance of agriculture 
to that. And of course, businesses in this sector have done all of that while facing the impacts of the cost crisis yourselves and while continuing to adapt your working practices following uh, the COVID pandemic. And throughout a difficult two or three years, that's probably the biggest understatement anybody has made today, a difficult two or three years, uh, an unprecedented two or three years in terms of the challenges it has posed. But throughout all of that, as well as all of that help that I've just talked about there, this sector has maintained a worldwide reputation for excellence, and that is no mean feat. The most recent report of the Global Financial Centres Index, of course, showed that Glasgow and Edinburgh are both ranked amongst the top 50 financial centres in the world. Uh, a recent City UK report showed that Scotland has a larger trade surplus in financial services than any part of the UK outside of London and the South East. In 2020, the sector in Scotland had a surplus of £4.6 billion. Pounds. So all of that is impressive. It would be impressive actually in times that hadn't been as tough as those we're living through. It is particularly impressive given the scale and the nature and the complexity of the challenges everybody has been grappling with. And of course, in some ways, none of that should be all that surprising to us because it reflects the fact that Scotland has long and well-established and well-recognised expertise in a variety of areas, ranging from fund management and insurance to newer fields, obviously, like fintech. So it's not surprising, but it is nevertheless an important reminder that the financial services sector in Scotland does continue, not just to be a national success story, but it is an international success story. And I think that's something we should be proud of. And it is something the country as a whole should be appreciative of uh, because it is something that is important to our history, our present, and absolutely to our country's future. And it's really in recognition of all of that that when the Scottish Government published our national strategy for economic transformation earlier this year, designed to uh, think about how we position the economy post-pandemic and how we uh, really build the success and the resilience and the sustainability of Scotland's economy. As we published that, we recognise very strongly the significance of finance, both as a sector which has the potential for further growth in itself, but also, of course, as a sector which is crucial to the growth of the wider economy. Uh, and it's especially relevant, I think, to look at green finance here. Uh, there is obviously, and for very obvious reasons, a growing international focus on this issue. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, of course, now includes uh, more than 550 financial institutions from around the world, uh, pledging that their investment decisions will be compatible with keeping global heating to 1.5 degrees, something that is still very much alive, but which we can't take for granted and need to continue to accelerate and intensify our progress uh, towards. And collectively, these institutions responsible, of course, for more than $150 trillion of assets uh, are a, a key resource here with the potential to be a major force in determining whether or not the world can meet that essential objective and, of course, tackle the climate crisis now for the sake of generations to come. As is uh, so often the case when we're talking about the climate crisis, it's important to be very clear about the moral imperative uh, that there is. And I, I use that term not loosely, uh, but I use it deliberately and advisedly. Uh, Financial institutions have a duty to support the move to net zero, as all of us do. But there is also, and I think this is important to constantly stress as well, in addition to that moral obligation, there is also a major, major opportunity here. Uh, City UK has, of course, been very active in pointing this out. A report it published last year showed that the green finance market has grown 100-fold since 2012. But we know that it will have to grow at a much faster rate in this decade in order to 
support the net zero transition. And that is why the City UK has very rightly, in my view, identified green finance as a priority area. And of course, it's also one reason why Scotland now has a green and sustainable financial services task force, which is led by the industry to agree the actions we need to take to make Scotland a much bigger centre for sustainable finance. And given our existing financial strengths and our potential in many net zero sectors, there is clearly enormous potential for green finance in Scotland to grow very significantly in the years ahead. That won't simply create jobs within the financial services sector, although it will undoubtedly do that. It should also help to accelerate our own transition to net zero by supporting the investment that we need to make in decarbonisation. And a good example of that, an essential example of that actually, is the decarbonisation of heat. Uh, we need to invest in energy efficiency and in renewable sources of heating as part of our transition to net zero. If we don't decarbonise there, we as a country will not meet our overall ambitions around uh, the climate emergency. Moving away from gas heating is also, at least in the medium term, potentially an important way of improving our energy security and making energy prices less volatile than they have been particularly in recent times. But decarbonising heat, although we know it is absolutely essential to all of these objectives, will require very significant levels of investment for Scotland and for uh, many other countries too. In Scotland, though, we believe it will probably require more than £30 billion of investment over the next 23 years. Now, some of that, significant amounts of that, will come from government. And, and during this five-year session of the Scottish Parliament, uh, we are already committed to provide almost £2 billion towards that total. So there will be an ongoing responsibility on government to contribute significantly uh, to that finance objective. But a large proportion of it will also need to come from businesses and also, of course, to some extent, from consumers. So that's why we established the Green Heat Finance Task Force to explore and come up with the solutions on the best ways of financing that investment. The task force will publish its interim conclusions in the spring and we hope and are confident that it will identify new financing mechanisms that can help to support the decarbonisation of heat. Uh, the membership includes members of the energy industry and the financial services sector. Sandy Begbie from SFE is one of the members. So it's a good example, I think, of how the sector is helping us very actively in a very practical sense to plan for and to achieve one of the biggest challenges, but also the biggest one of the biggest opportunities uh, that we face in making the journey to net zero. The Green Heat Finance Task Force is also a good example of how the Scottish Government is, like all governments, having to think more creatively, often in partnership with industry and finance, about how we invest in the transition to net zero. Another example of us doing that is the Scottish National Investment Bank that was established last year. It is intended to and is already providing an additional source of investment alongside private finance for projects that fulfil or advance specific missions. Uh, those missions include, uh, as the key priority, the transition to net zero. Further example is the green investment portfolio, which features market-ready projects in total worth around three billion pounds, aiming to attract domestic and international investment by raising the profile of these investment opportunities so that capital has visibility of the projects here uh, that are investable uh, and which are necessary for us to meet our objectives. So all of that uh, is important work and necessary essential work in terms of these objectives that all of us face. Uh, the final example I want to discuss though relates directly uh, to capital investment for infrastructure. You know, Scotland traditionally has, I think, a very good reputation when it comes to attracting 
international investment in terms of new company offices and facilities. Uh, just yesterday, in fact, I broke ground for a new manufacturing uh, centre uh, for the company DSM based in North Ayrshire. That company is investing more than £100 million in a facility which will manufacture. It's the first uh, manufacturing site globally uh, to make a feed additive to reduce the methane emissions of livestock. It's something that is essential uh, to reduce emissions overall in agriculture, one of the biggest sources of emissions in a Scottish context. So that's a, another example, I think, of the opportunities that the transition to net zero uh, is offering. But while we've been very successful in terms of investment for facilities and offices and for companies to come here and employ people, and we're, uh, that's very important and something we need to keep working at. To be candid, we've not been yet as successful as we want to be and need to be in attracting international investment in infrastructure. And that does have to change. Uh, because we need capital investment, for example, in our wind turbines, hydrogen power stations, transmission cables, if we're going to fully take advantage and capitalise on the massive opportunities that we have, often from our natural resources, uh, that can bring significant benefit to us, but that are essential to get us to net zero and for us to make a contribution in, uh, to the world reaching net zero. So that's why the National Strategy for Economic Transformation uh, confirmed that the Scottish Government would establish a special investor panel to provide us with very uh, practical and expert advice on how we can, as a country, improve our performance in attracting capital investment. Uh, I will co-chair that panel, uh, which has representation from the investor community, including the financial services sector, and we're confirming today that the other co-chair will be Angus McPherson, the chief executive of Noble. Um, I met Angus on Monday uh, to discuss uh, the, the panel and his role in co-chairing it and was struck, not surprisingly, not, not just by his expertise, which is beyond uh, a shadow of doubt, but in particular by his enthusiasm for taking on this role. I think he recognises that securing capital investment, yes, from sources within Scotland, but also from across the UK and Europe, right around the world indeed, is absolutely crucial to us meeting our net zero targets um, and that there's a lot of competition for this capital. So it's important to get it right, to make sure we are using our potential to full advantage, that we are moving quickly in exploiting uh, the assets that we have got and where necessary, we're reducing barriers, actual or perceived, uh, to investors uh, coming here and making a contribution to everything we are trying to achieve. So I think that the work of that panel is going to be really crucial in the near term uh, to giving us the advice in order to position ourselves to do better than we have done in the past and to attract the capital that is essential for us to succeed in the many ways I'm talking about. Now, the last point I want to make to you today uh, about the investor panel is that, like the task forces I mentioned earlier, it does, I hope, demonstrate the government's commitment to working in partnership with the financial services sector. Uh, we know, and the evidence is all around us in Scotland, how crucial you are to supporting not just your own sector and the employment and economic activity associated with that, but as I said earlier on, and as you know all too well, how critical you are to supporting sustainable growth in the economy overall. So we want to, and I'll be quite shameless in saying this, we want to use to the full your insights and your expertise as we continue to recover from the pandemic, as we navigate our way through the current multitude of challenges, or maybe that's just how it seems on a, an average day, that we are facing across Scotland, the UK and the world right now. And in the longer term, as we get on with and accelerate our progress in the task of ensuring the just and rapid transition to net zero. Uh, all of these are urgent and important tasks, but I hope also that in many ways, particularly that transition to net zero, they're also inspiring ones because that, to be uh, quite blunt and to sort of uh, take it down to its essentials, that is about saving our planet for the generations who come after us. If that can't inspire us, nothing uh, will. 
Uh, and that point I made earlier, that tackling the climate crisis is both a moral obligation and an economic opportunity, is certainly true, I think, uh, for this sector. So we have the chance right now to establish Scotland as a major centre for green and ethical finance while helping Scotland move to net zero and positioning Scotland to help the rest of the world get there as well. So for that reason and for many, many more reasons that I've not had the time to talk in detail about today, the success of Scotland's financial services sector is vital, absolutely indispensable to the prosperity of our businesses, to the well-being of communities, the length and breadth of our country, and to our wider, longer-term ambitions for a strong, fair and sustainable economy. Uh, so that's why I'm really delighted to be here today, and I'm delighted that this event has been taking place here in a bit of a chilly uh, Edinburgh, but nevertheless, uh, beautiful capital city of Edinburgh. And I'm so pleased and very committed to supporting the further development of the cooperation between the Scottish Financial Enterprise and the City UK. I think it is flourishing and I think it has got great potential for the future. So let me wish all of you well for the future as we work to get together to get through undoubtedly a difficult winter, but to lay the foundations for a prosperous, resilient net zero economy. So thank you for your time today and I very much look forward to working with all of you in the months and years to come. Thank you. Thank you.